Well, good morning. It is flu shot season again. Have you gotten your flu shot? You have. You have. All right. If you haven't gotten a flu shot, are you planning to? I, I must confess, I have, not, I have not gotten my flu shot yet, and I, I need to do that. One of my coworkers uh, went and got his flu shot and then got deathly ill for almost a week afterwards, and he thinks that it was because of the flu shot. I don't know about that, but I just, I just want to say right up front, this is not a sermon about COVID. I'm, I'm not even going to refer to COVID. I'm not even going to use the word COVID from this point forward in the sermon. Okay? So that's a promise. No more talk about that. No, this, this, uh, this actually is a message about the best part of the good news. That's the title of my sermon. And we're looking at Romans chapter 3, verses 35, 25 through 31. And in this text, what we see is the best part of the good news, the gospel. The word gospel means good news. And that's what Jesus wanted us to preach to the whole world, was good news. The problem is, a lot of people don't recognize the good news as good news. And part of the reason why is because of the same reason that people don't get flu shots. The same reason people don't get immunized. The same people reason don't but people don't uh, pay attention to the food they eat or the lack of exercise or other things that may be considered precautionary. Now, I had chicken pox when I was a kid, which makes me susceptible to this other thing called shingles. Now, shingles is already in my system. That virus is already there because I've had chicken pox. Uh, have you all had chicken pox? Oh, praise the Lord. Well, you, you are fortunate that you haven't had chicken pox. But now that you've gotten older, that makes you actually more susceptible to the worst part of chicken pox. The older you, the, when you're younger and you get it, you just get these little pimples all over your body and it itches like crazy. And um, But the older you get... If, even if you've had chicken pox, you could get shingles. Now, shingles is a really, really nasty thing. Have you seen the commercials that talk about shingles and, and, and it'll show the, these horrible, painful rashes? And uh, Okay, so it's really bad, though. If you saw it, you'd go, oh, man, I don't want to get shingles. I don't care. You know, shingles is just a word until you've had it, and then it's an experience. And once you've had shingles, you would never want to have it again. So I actually went and got the vaccine to keep from getting shingles because I saw the commercial. I saw the rash. And I could could feel how painful that would be to have those rashes all over my body. That would be a horrible thing. So in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul gives us the theme verse in chapter 1, verse 16. He said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. So that's the theme verse. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is God's power to save for everybody. Now, he spends... The rest of the book, all the way up to chapter 3, verse 25, underscoring the reason why this gospel is such good news. And basically what he says in a word is the reason why the gospel is such good news is because without it, we are facing a horrible future. In other words, Paul is showing us the hellish shingles rash that we would have without the good news. And he's saying the gospel saves you from all of that. Everything he says 
leads up from 116 all the way to chapter 3, verse 20, we find him making the case why the gospel is so important. So then in chapter 3, verses 20 through 24, he says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are freely justified by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That's the, that's the bad news and the good news. The bad news is without Jesus, we're lost. The good news is through Jesus, we can be saved. Jonathan Edwards uh, was an American preacher in the 18th century who was part of the beginning of, of the, the so-called Great Awakening. Uh, he was a Puritan pastor. He, uh, he read his manuscripts, and, and in, uh, on one a particular uh, Sunday in July, after being frustrated by so many members of his congregation being out and reveling in the bars and partying all night long, he had finally had enough of it, and he realized that these folks in his church were not bearing witness of the changing power of the gospel. They simply weren't living it out. And so he prepared a sermon that he titled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And in that sermon, Edwards does exactly what the Apostle Paul does in Romans chapter 1, verses 18, through chapter 3, verse 19. He raises the need. Let me just read you a, a little bit of what Edwards says here. I just think this is so fun. Well, uh, fun. It's, you're not going to see this as fun, but imagine, imagine hearing this for the first time. That world of misery, that lake of burning brimstone is extended abroad under you. There is the dreadful pit of the glowing flames of the wrath of God. There is hell's wide gaping mouth open. And you have nothing to stand upon, nor anything between you and hell but the air. It is only the power and mere pleasure of God that holds you up. You are probably not sensible to this. You find you are kept out of hell. But do not see the hand of God in it. But look at other things. As the good state of your bodily condition, your care of your own life, and the means you use of your own personal preservation. But indeed, these things are nothing. If God should withdraw his hand, they would avail no more to keep you from falling than the thin air to hold up a person suspended in it. Your wickedness makes you, as it were, heavy as lead. And to rend downwards with great weight and pressure towards hell. And if God should let you go, you would immediately sink and swiftly descend and plunge into the bottomless gulf. And your healthy constitution and your own care and preservation, your best contrivance and all of your righteousness would have no more influence to uphold you and keep you out of hell than a spider's web would have to stop a rock from falling. Woo! Well, Edwards was doing exactly what Paul was doing. He was trying to raise the need. This, Listen, without the gospel, this isn't popular today. We, we tend to downplay the wrath of God. We tend to downplay our horrible lost estate without the saving work of Jesus Christ. We don't want to think about the fact that humanity as a whole is facing eternal separation from God without Jesus Christ and his saving work on our behalf. 
We don't want to think about that. We often overlook it or we assume that it's just something that preachers talk about, but it's not really all that big of a deal. I mean, if it were really that bad, wouldn't we know about it? And that's the problem. The problem is nobody appreciates the good news. And I'm here to tell you that the best part of the good news is not hell. The best part of the good news is not about you, and it's not about our ability to perform. The best part of the gospel is not coming to church or living the godly life. The best part of the gospel is God's greatness. God is great. And that's what the gospel reveals. And in this text, Romans 3, 25 through 31, we see that the gospel highlights three attributes of God's greatness. In verses 25 and 26, we see that the gospel highlights God's justice. So let's read uh, the first part of verse 25. Romans 3, 25, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Now, Romans, I, I just have to tell you, is my favorite book. It's not just my favorite Bible book. It's my favorite book. If somebody said, what, what is your favorite all-time book? It's the book of Romans. Because it is the most important theological book in the world. We would not be able to make sense of the Gospels themselves. The story of Jesus' life, his perfect sinless life, his sacrifice on the cross, his burial in the grave, his resurrection from the dead, his ascension to glory. We wouldn't be able to make sense of any of that without the book of Romans. Romans is the key that unlocks the mystery of God's purposes through Jesus Christ for our benefit. Romans is the book that unlocks the mystery of the gospel. And what we see here is that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. So, what does all of this mean? This presented stuff. He presented Jesus to the world. And he presented to Jesus to the world as a Sacrifice of atonement. That's what the NIV says. The sacrifice of atonement. It's actually the Greek word hilosterion. And uh, you know what it literally means? It means to steer away God's wrath. The sacrifice of atonement actually has implied in its meaning the reality of God's wrath. It's like this giant comet coming at planet Earth. And it's like Jesus emerges as the superhero. Dun, da, da, da. You know, it's like he's presented to the entire human race as the one who explodes this comet before it strikes planet Earth. That's the dramatic portrayal that Paul is making here in Romans chapter 3. Jesus is our superhero. Jesus emerges as this this one and only Savior who's able to avert God's wrath before it strikes us. Jonathan Edwards was right. Hell is a gaping reality that Jesus delivers us from. And here, there's a twist. Sin has to be punished. Sin cannot be overlooked. But in Jesus, God not only punishes sin, what, what Jesus does or what God does is pay for our sin through Jesus. So in Jesus, God the Father punishes sin and simultaneously pays for sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory 
of God, Paul said. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, when Paul said all, there was one exception. Everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, except who? Jesus. Jesus came, and he came as a human being. That's why the incarnation, the doctrine of the incarnation is so important. Jesus wasn't just some spirit being. Jesus actually became a human being. And as a human being, he was subjected to temptation at every level, just as we are, with one exception. He didn't succumb. He rose above temptation. He lived a perfectly sinless life. And therefore, when he went to the cross, he could receive not only the the penalty for sin, a, a sin that he didn't deserve, but he could become the payment the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. Because once you sin, the only thing we face is death. And therefore, we can't do anything except die. Except face an eternity apart from God. That's ultimately what death means. Death means separation. And so when we die, not only are we separated from life as we now know it, we're separated from the one who gives life. But Jesus is the sacrifice for our sin. He's the payment. God is not only just, but he's the justifier of those who have faith in Christ. So verse 20, uh, the second part of verse 25 said, He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Wait a minute. He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished? What does he mean by that? Okay, think about this now. All through the Old Testament, God forgave sin. He forgave it. Like when David sinned with Bathsheba. God forgave him. How how could he forgive him? There was no sacrifice for that sin. You say, well, the animals, the, the animal sacrifice, well, you know, the writer of Hebrews says the blood of bulls and goats don't take away sin. They point to Jesus, who's the ultimate sacrifice. So all the sins that God forgave before the cross were unpunished. At least that's how it looked. So it would be like going into a courtroom and the judge says, now, 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 if you were in a traffic court, so I know none of you have ever been in a traffic court. You've never gotten a speeding ticket, never had to show up. I've been in a couple, more than a couple through my life. And uh, I would be really bothered if the judge were to take the person who was just in front of me and says, so, you know, I was going 120 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone. And, and uh, I have really no excuse. I just, I was having a bad day. I had an argument with my wife and, and uh, I just needed to get out and clear my head. And I was upset and I was just driving as fast as I possibly could through that school zone. And the crossing guard had to jump off the the curb into the bushes to get away from me. And and the judge says, you know, I had a fight with my wife today. And you know what? I didn't do 120, but I did 80. I think I might have gotten that same crossing guard to jump into the bushes. You know what I'll do? I'm just going to cancel that debt. You, you, you You don't owe anything. You just go ahead, go on home. And then I come up, and I'm, I'm uh, well, Your Honor, I've, I've gone 10 miles an hour, the speed limit. I was going through this speed trap. I didn't even know the, I didn't even see the, the, the speed limit sign because the bushes had grown in front of it. I didn't even, that was the first time I'd been down that road. He said, there's no excuse for you. You get a $120 fine for that. Now, I'd be a little upset because I would see that judge as, in a word, unjust. 
right? Because he's letting things slide that shouldn't slide. And he's punishing other people, but he's letting this slide. And even if he let everybody go in his court, what if he let everybody go? Wouldn't you feel a little weird about that? You'd say, well, what's the purpose of these cops even giving tickets? Why would there even be warnings if there's absolutely no consequences for it? That would be unjust. In Jesus, God demonstrated his justice. He proved that he didn't really pass over those sins at all. He punished those sins. And he punished all sin in Jesus. So the reason why God could forgive those who were genuinely repentant in the Old Testament is not because of any good thing they did, not even the animal sacrifices. The reason why God forgave people in the Old Testament, just as the reason why God can forgive people now, is because of the sacrifice of Jesus. God lives outside of time. So God is able to see the sacrifice of Jesus before it actually happened. And he was appropriating the saving merits of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross back to Noah, back to David, back to Moses, back to all of the people who sinned and fell short of God's glory in the Old Testament. All of that was appropriated backwards from the cross. The cross is the focal point of God's salvation history. Everything begins and ends with the cross. God is just, and he's the justifier of those who have faith in Christ. The gospel is all about God's greatness. And one of the greatest attributes of God's greatness is his justice. God doesn't let anything slide. He paid for it all in Jesus. The gospel also highlights another attribute of God's greatness here. And that is God's kindness. The gospel highlights God's kindness in verses 27 and 28. And God's kindness leaves no room for boasting. It's all about God. It's not about us. And so Paul writes in Romans uh, 3.27, Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No. Because of the law that requires faith. I can't boast about this. I can't say, and, and this is a problem, right? Uh, and, and this is what brings a lot of criticism against Christians who act as though they somehow earn their salvation by going to church or by living the good life or whatever. And, and uh, our, our relationship with God is not sustained by our ability to perform. It's not based on how good I am. It's based on God's kindness. I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 28 through 31. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness and holiness and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord." Listen, if I'm, if I'm going to be at all excited about my salvation in Jesus Christ, it's because of God's greatness. It's not because of anything that I bring to the table. And this idea of knowing the Lord and walking with the Lord and boasting in the Lord and what the Lord has done for us, that's not even new to the New Testament. That goes all the way back to the Old Testament. I think of what the prophet Jeremiah writes. Jeremiah 9, 22 and 23. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength or the rich boast of their riches. Let, but let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. God just wants us to know him and to celebrate him, and to revel in his goodness. That's part of what living the gospel life is. It's loving God and experiencing his kindness and celebrating that. God's kindness is not based on the principle of reciprocity. 
It's not based on my ability to perform or uh, doing so much good works that God says, well, I'm, you know, you've, you've done uh, enough good works in your life. I'm going to go ahead and let you in. And it's not that way at all. Um, Paul says in, in uh, 328, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Now that word works of the law in, in the NIV here is actually ergonomu. Uh, it's a Greek phrase, works of law. There's no definite article, works of law. It describes a certain kind of approach to your relationship with God. Works of law describes that orientation toward God that says, I got to earn brownie points. I've got to do all of these good works in order to maintain God's favor. And we've had so much moralistic preaching. Uh, this ha has infected the church as much as infected people outside the church who thinks that being in a relationship with God is based on the principle of reciprocity. Let me tell you something. Every other world religion is predicated on the principle of reciprocity. Every other world religion is predicated upon the principle of reciprocity. You get what you deserve. That is not the message of the gospel. The gospel says we get what we don't deserve. We get God's kindness when we deserve God's wrath. And we don't get God's kindness because we're good people. We get God's kindness because Jesus was good. Because Jesus paid the penalty of our sin. And because God the Father in his kindness made all of the perfection of Jesus available to us on the basis of simple faith. Receive it. God holds it out to us as a gift and says, receive it. That's the greatness of God. God is not only just, not only does he adhere to the law, or not only is he a just judge, he is kind. He extends to us this great salvation. But what we can, what we can say is, what we can say rightly, theologically correctly, is that faith plus nothing equals salvation. But it is not right to say that faith plus no works equals the Christian life. Now this is where it gets tricky, okay? Saving faith gives us the full merits of Christ's sacrifice without anything that we do. And there's nothing that we do in the Christian life that merits it more. But here's the cool thing. When we trust Jesus, when we invite Jesus into our lives to be our Lord and our Savior, the Holy Spirit fills us and takes over our lives and redirects our passions toward the things that we love the most. As Augustine said, love the Lord with all your heart and do whatever you please. The reason why Augustine could say that is because Augustine understood God's grace. So James puts it this way in James chapter 2. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace keep warm, well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by action. Faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. So faith, if it's real faith, it's going to produce these good deeds because it's the, it's the fruit of a relationship with God. But, but make no mistake about it, the fruit is not the means of our salvation. Don't get the cart before the horse. But alternatively, don't just assume that anyone can make a claim of faith and, and if they evidence no change of life, no transformation, they probably 
aren't in a real life transforming relationship with God, if that makes sense. So that, in other words, our response to God's kindness is a life of love and devotion to God, but the love and devotion to God is not a means of salvation. So it only goes in one direction. Does that make sense? Okay. So the best part of the gospel is God's greatness. God is just, God is kind, and what we find in the closing verses, verses 29 through 31, is that God is supreme. The gospel highlights God's supremacy. We see that in verses 29 through 31. So reading verses 29 and 30, or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of the Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. In other words, God and God alone is supreme. The gospel is not the best alternative among many choices. The gospel is the only alternative when it comes to being rightly related to God. There is no other choices. There are no other roads that lead to heaven. And this is a huge mistake in our pluralistic culture that wants to celebrate diversity. And uh, now listen, I'm all for diversity if we're talking about diversity in the right kind of way. Racial, ethnic diversity is super important. Um, it's also important for us to accord respect and, and uh, love to those who differ from us, even those who reject the gospel, right? So there's, there's a sense in which um, Christians should be the kindest people in the world. But that doesn't mean that we surrender our convictions. And we say, there is no such thing as right and wrong. It's, you know, it's whatever floats people's boat. So, you know, this is what I believe, but, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to be, you know, imposing my, my belief system on other people. And, um, you know, when Jesus said, go into the world and preach the gospel, I don't know how you can interpret that, but in one way you could say Jesus was commanding us to impose our beliefs on other people. He was, he was commanding us to invite people to the reality of God's greatness. Now that's, again, do we let our light shine or do we let it glare? Right? Now there's a way... There, there are ways that we can do this that are really ineffective. Uh, so if it's all about making the gospel as appealing to as many people as we possibly can, then we need to follow Paul's example, who said in 1 Corinthians 9, to the Jew, I became as a Jew. To the Gentiles, I became as, to those without the law, I became, I, I became as someone without the law. No, no, no I'm, I mean, I'm not totally without the law, you know, but Paul was, Paul was saying, I tried as best I could to be as accommodating, to relate to people, to respect them, to, to listen to their stories, to hear what they had to say, so they knew that I truly empathized and understood where they were coming from, rather than just coming down on them with a hammer. We see Paul do that in the book of Acts, when he was at the Areopagus, uh, or Mars Hill. Uh, he stood there, and what did he do when they gave him the opportunity to preach? He didn't say, you know what, I've gone around the city of Athens, and I've seen how stupid you all are. You know, you've got all of these shrines to these unknown gods, or these different gods. You even got one to the unknown god. Oh, like, what is that? You know, uh, I mean, if that's not stupid, I don't know what is. Uh, you know what? You know, the, the psalm says, those who worship senseless idols become like them, neither seeing nor hearing. You know, there, there were other approaches that Paul could have taken in Athens. And they would have gotten him booted out right away. But he didn't. He came and he said, hey, you know what? I'm looking around. I see how good you, how, how, how godly you all are. I mean, you're so godly. There's a shrine on every corner. Man, oh man. In fact, you are, you are so godly. You even have a shrine 
to the unknown God. You know what? You really want to cover your bases, don't you? You want to make sure you don't miss any of them. But listen, it's that one, that one to the unknown God. That's the one I want to talk to you about. It's the one you don't know yet. His name is Jesus. And here's what Jesus did for you. And so he, again, got on their wavelength. He connected with them. He didn't repudiate them. But listen, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. There is only one gospel, and it's available for all. And it's, it's super important that we understand that and live into that. Because that God, that's an acknowledgement of God's greatness. Embracing God's supremacy by accepting the gospel by faith is the ultimate fulfillment of God's purposes for our lives. Paul says in verse 31, Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. The whole purpose of the law of Moses was designed to lead us to Christ. That's what Paul says in Galatians 3.24. Galatians 3.24, the law was our guardian leading us to Christ so that we could be made right with God through faith. So I come back to where we started. Have you gotten your flu shot? Or have you gotten your shingles vaccine? Because Jonathan Edwards was right. We are facing a horrible blight without taking preemptive measures. And the one and only preemptive measure available to you to save yourself from an eternity separated from God is to receive the good news by faith. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He offers that to you freely through faith. The gospel manifests God's justice. He didn't let sin slide He's not just winking at sin. He paid the full price for all of human sin in Jesus. And he invites us to accept that. Because God isn't only just, he's kind. And he extends to us his unconditional love that's not based on our ability to perform or the law of reciprocity. It's based solely on his kindness. Another word is mercy. God is merciful. And he wants to be in a relationship with us. He wants that so much that he sacrificed his only begotten son to make that happen. And there isn't a choice of uh, the gospel being one of many different options. He's offered this one way because God is supreme and he wants us to embrace his supremacy by embracing his one and only son, Jesus Christ, who gives us that gift of eternal life. So, the only thing left for us to do is to get our gospel shot, right? Because when you get your gospel shot, God will get you. And God will make sure that nothing in your life is ever the same. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for the gospel. We're thankful for the realization that without the gospel, we would be lost. And so, part of why we often live our lives without deeply appreciating the gospel and its implications for our lives is because we just don't understand how lost we are without it. So today, Lord, I pray that you would just remind us afresh of how huge this gift of eternal life is. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to live out our lives fully for you and to do so with hearts that are overflowing with joy and gratitude because of your unconditional love and kindness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.